Good morning. Now, I see it seems like we can all fit in here. I did reserve the room next door as well, and I'm copying everything in there. Um, that one is blank in here, but it shows the camera feed from over there next door. Um, but if we can be in here, of course, it's nicer to just be in the same room. Um, I'm also, as I wrote out, streaming everything live and should be live right now. I should just check that the sound is also out there. No, it is. I'm quite sure. Let me just check. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, welcome to Times Analysis. It's good to see all of you here. It's sometimes a challenge when you book a room at some point in time and then kind of people start, keep signing up. Of course, that's a positive problem, but uh, this room is meant for 80 and we are roughly, I mean, 114 signed up right now. So, um, we'll make it work. I think that's the end of the day. Um, and hopefully we can say the same at the end of the course that that was not a problem. So today, a little bit of practical information, some introduction to what is exactly what we're going to be doing, and then including a, a brief outline of the course, and then we'll step into chapter two, that there'll be some parts that you have known from the past, and there are some parts that I will kind of rephrase in a little different setting, uh, but it's just to make sure that we are all on the same page. And I'm sure there's something that is a little bit more general than most of you have seen so far. Um, so how to get a hold of me? Usually the easiest way is to send me an email. Um, now we'll have given how many we are, we'll be totally four helping out during the exercise time to be at Hamid and Matthias and myself, um, starting at 10 every week. I will, I don't know how many of you who have looked at it, did you learn? How many have looked at it? <laughs> I mean, th that is also what looked at. Have you logged in? <laughs> I don't know how many of you experienced problems logging in, because did you make a change of some active directory, whatever, um, was it on Tuesday, and I was not able to log in, and that was not fun. Um, I fixed it by removing some cookies. So, um, in order to make sure that you can all get in today, I made a small quiz in there that we'll do after the lecture, so we can test if things are working for you guys, and if there are problems, we'll try to resolve them before you leave today. Um, it's basically just because there's a new login page. And Chrome, at least from my experience, Chrome remembers something from my previous sessions where I was logged in, and then, yeah, it screwed up. <laughs> um, so what I would like is that all the discussions that are, you can say, could be of interest to others and just yourself, make those as a, in, a, in a general comment uh, discussions topic in learn, then there may be others who can kind of benefit from that. Um, I think since did you just started using learn right now, I don't know if you've seen it in other courses, then I will make a small demo just showing you what I expect you to do later today. But first we get into what is the content and then later we can kind of look at the technicalities. Um, it provides a lot of flexibility over what has been used to be in inside slash campus net for controlling a course. Um, some nice things and some things that makes me have to use the mouse quite a bit, but that's another story. So, but of course you can also drop me an email. And I do have an office just a little bit that way. Um, feel free to drop by, but don't expect me to be there uh, if you just come at a random time. Uh, of course I'm there, but I'm also often not there. So what is the content of this course? Well, it's called time series analysis. So I guess you will not be surprised to say, well, this is a time series. You observe something over time. Um, in this case, we have some data on the number of mink and muskrat skins that are traded during a period. It's fairly old data. Um, and then we're looking at what, what is it actually we want to do? 
Well, first of all, whenever, you, whenever I get data, I typically want to visualize it, and I want to make a model that describes it. And the purpose of that modeling is typically to make a prediction. So to predict out into the future, but now what is the likelihood that I'm going to observe those values along that curve or that curve? What is the likelihood I'm going to observe those exact numbers? Sorry? Zero, Zero. exactly. Why? Exactly. It's a point estimate, and the likelihood of observing a point in a continuous distribution is zero. Now you can say in this case, it's actually greater than zero, because how many skins do you trade? It's an integer number. So you have rounding. In practice, you always have rounding. But in theory, when you look at the normal distribution, the likelihood of observing a value is zero. So to provide the answer as just a point estimate, does not provide much information about what you expect. I mean, it's the expected value, yes, but what is likely to happen? You need to somehow add a measure of uncertainty. In this case, it's a 95% prediction interval, so I'm 95% confident that I'm going to observe numbers within that range. And within that range, given the model, and given the data I have. And that's basically what I want to do. This is a multivariate setting. We'll start with a univariate setting, meaning we just look at one time at a time, but we want to get into the multivariate as well. So another case, one thing that for me, when you look at data, let's go back, look at this. If you look at the blue here, the muskrats, when you just look at it, what is it that you see? What is your intuition in this? What's happening? What is the pattern? Yeah, yeah, you say there is a pattern. Can you describe the pattern? Yes, so you have some peaks and then some droughts afterwards. You have what I would call some oscillations. Um, that's one thing. Another thing that I see here is also you have an increase over time, even though you can say the minimum are almost the same, then the maximum is increasing. That also means that the amplitude is changing over time. So it's not at all a stationary process when we look at it like that. Um, just to We'll come with a more formal definition of stationarity later on, but just to kind of get to think of it, the red one here, you really cannot say much because of scaling <laughs> in this case. You will also do some other plots to do that, to show that. Now, this is a chloroplast one month data. And you could say, what I want to look at here is what happens when you change the time scale. So here we look at one month, and it's from last fall. And basically, when you look at it, you say, well, maybe there's a downward trend, maybe there's a wave. It's hard to say anything about what is actually going on behind this. So the obvious question from a statistician is, give me more data. So we'll take some more data and look at a full year. So what is now the conclusion? I think, first of all, we can say, well, we have still some oscillations. We have some noise of some kind. Um, that should not be a surprise. But it seems that it's fairly stable, in a sense. I mean, it oscillates around something, does some weird things, but it's not changing a lot. But now, if we get even more data, well, maybe this recent year, we're going back to year 2002 here in the beginning. Something has happened. Now, when you look at this, is it just flat down here? No, it is increasing at all times. So 
one way of looking at this, again, we also see when we get to higher values, we see larger oscillations. Whereas when you're smaller numerical values, you get smaller observations. When you have that phenomenon, you also want to do, uh, often want to do transformations. And one such transformation is to take the logarithm. And by doing that, now you get something where the variance seems to be more homogeneous. And you basically have a linear trend in the log domain. So what is now the interpretation having a linear increase in the log domain? I don't know if you've thought of that before. What is the straight line in the log domain? What does that mean? Yes? Yes, exactly. It's exponential growth of what is underneath. That means whenever you're taking one step forward, you multiply by a number that is greater than one. And then you multiply by that number again and again. In expectation, of course, there is, again, some noise around it. So that stuff, we'll try to say, how do we find out when to do these transformations? Of course, sometimes we can just see it, and sometimes we have to kind of do some diagnostics to get there. Another, you can say now it's a bit old, this case. Non monthly airline passengers in the US. Again, you can see a seasonality. It's very clear. And you have a steady linear increase on top of that until something happened. I guess you still remember what happened. So I won't get into that strategy. But you can say, what is the purpose of this course? It's not to predict the unpredictable. So if we can just get here and everything works out fine, then I'm actually fairly happy. And we should make a sensible prediction. And then when we say we have a 95% confidence in our prediction interval, that also means that in 5% of the cases, we do expect things to be outside. So there is room for these extreme cases. And if you take the data a little bit further out in time, it actually goes back to the original trend. It is just and then back up. So the model as such is fairly robust. The pattern does not change. People are always traveling more for the different seasons, for different holidays, um, going home for Thanksgiving and Christmas doing stuff over summer, those things, um, whereas in the beginning of the year, not much happens. So, but, but this here, that's something totally different. Now, what I have here is at the top, the heat consumption in what is called the VEX area. So it's a district heating network covering not all of Copenhagen, but a great part of Copenhagen. Um, actually not right here, uh, but you have to go for the city of Copenhagen and then all the way west to Roskilde is actually connected to the VEX uh, transmission network for district heating. So what you have here is an old gigajoules per hour. That's kind of a unit that says it's a lot of energy. I don't know if you can reflect to that. Except just giga is 10 to the ninth. Um, but anyways, um, you can think of, if you want to, how many small boilers from your kitchen table do you need to turn on in order to deliver that? That's quite a bit. So what is that you see here? That's the heat consumption. And then down here, well, what drives <coughs> thermal load? That's the outdoor temperature and district heating network. So you see when it's cold outside, the heat consumption increases. But there's one more thing to it. What is happening more? That's one thing I haven't said that is quite obvious when you look at the data for the heat consumption. Yes? Exactly. There is a daily variation that is much greater than what you can explain by the temperature. So 
If you just do an ordinary linear regression model, this is what you get. And if you look at this, what would you say normally in an ordinary statistics course? Would you say this is fine? What are the assumptions? Yes? Yes, indeed they are. What are the assumptions for doing a linear regression model? Yes? So there's a linear relationship, yes, and what about independence? Yes, the observations are independent, or the errors are independent, indeed. That's one more thing that they should have the same variance. Uh, now, when you just look at it like this, and if you do all the usual diagnostic plots, you may not actually see that they are not independent. If you take those errors there for that model and plot them, I'll do that in a moment. You're not probably not surprised based on what we looked at before, uh, but uh, let's just go and look at it. We see that all the errors here. Here you again easily see the daily variation. Is still there. So the errors are not independent. So that's something we need to correct for. What does it mean? It means that the variance is inflated compared to a good model, which means that we actually don't get all the information out of the data that we could have. So we can make a much better model if we can do that. If we have an independent, what I call white noise signal, then you get what you have down here. That's just the same number of samples with just random white noise. I don't know, have you heard about white noise before? How many have heard about white noise? Whoa, that was more in which course? In which relation? Or just heard it somewhere? So wh wh what is white noise then? <laughs> yes? Yes, so it's basically saying that all frequencies are equally represented. I don't know if you're old enough to have heard a, a good old radio. If you put that in between an FM radio, in between stations, basically you have white noise. Not totally white, but reasonably white noise. Do you also know what pink noise is? You can guess it. So why, why, why white? White because sunlight is white, because sunlight have all frequencies. All of a sudden, if you start talking about another color of noise, it means that that particular fraction of the frequency, that frequency domain is overrepresented. So pink noise has more high frequencies, whereas red noise has more <coughs> lower frequencies. That was a side step. So, what is it that gives us this? Patterns. Why is this different from, why should we do something different than just a linear regression model? An ordinary linear regression model. It's linked to the question on the previous slide, what is a dynamical system? I don't know how much you've thought of that. I can say I come from a section called dynamical systems. <laughs> so it's not just something that I use. So what is a dynamical system? You've done many of those in various settings, I'm sure. To be, to be dynamic, what is that you're doing? Often from a mathematical point of view, you use equations of a particular kind. But what does that constitute a dynamical system? As opposed to not. <coughs> That's, yeah. Because it's a system that varies over time. It's a system that varies where some states or something is changing over time, exactly. 
So it, it's something where if you are in a continuous time deterministic, you say whenever you have a differential equation, you're pretty much describing a dynamical system. Because there you have equations for each of the states of the system, and you look at how do they change over time. That's a dynamical system, and that's also where this correlation that we have in time up here, that comes from that point. I don't know how many of you who have remembered that, say, your heating source in your house broke down. I have. <laughs> um, how long time does it take before you actually realize it was down? Eight hours. Eight hours? Okay, yeah, but it takes quite a while at least. Um, so why is that? It's because you have a lot of bricks typically in a Danish house, so it doesn't cool off immediately. That also means that if you get home to a cold house and want to reheat it, even though things are working, usually it's not warm within hours. I mean, it takes some hours before it's nice, at least at this season. Uh, of course, in the summertime, it's not a problem. Um, so that's just one example of dynamical systems. The heating network is also one huge dynamical system. The water from the heat, the water, and put it out in the system until it returns, that also takes hours. I, don't, I mean, I've heard numbers up to say half a day to kind of get the water out and back. Totally just because of the dis distances that are out there. So what is most uh, effective to do? Effective to turn down or just leave it as stationary level? So that depends on what your goal is. <laughs> From whom? <laughs> to save money for you guys. Okay, um, so if you do, you can say turn down the temperature during night time. It depends actually, it, it depends on your heating source. In practice, in theory, if you can turn down the temperature, the lower the average temperature is for your house, the, the lower the heat loss is. That's fairly simple. But if the effectiveness of your heating source depends on, it, it, it's negatively affected by the fact that then in the morning time, you have to deliver more power than what your steady power will be. If that is less effic efficient, then you may lose the benefit you have from lowering the temperature during the night time. So if you have a heat pump, for instance, and you have a well insulated house, you'll probably just leave it running. If you don't really want to have it colder during the night time, um, if you have a district heating network, it depends on your um, supplier. What is the cost? Because if you want to have more power out of the water that comes there, you also often have a warmer return temperature, and then you may have a penalty on that. So you have to do the math. To, ma to maximize that, um, we can take that, uh, that. That can be a very long and very detailed discussion. Um, so, but it, I mean, it is a, a complicated thing to kind of equate out. So, that was just about what are the things that we're going to look at trying to describe in various ways. So, you say this system is where you have. Something that you measure, and then you have, oh, sorry, from the previous here, the temperature here is an input to the system. And you say, well, how does the temperature drive? Yes? Those small oscillations yes. I don't know this particular data set well enough to say it could be that people turn off the heat at night. It could also be because given the delay in the system, that they actually turn down the production at some point in time. And then they can just they have a buffer in the system. Yes. If you want to know what's going on, what is the demand? The, the, my, the problem is, I don't know exactly where these observations are made. Are they from the what goes out into the grid, or are they, you can say, the what is consumed out the at the ends? 
I think it's a former. Um, so the reason may actually be an artifact for this, because some, I don't know, I'm just speculating right now. Some of the combined heat and power, uh, power stations in southern Copenhagen, what they do, a uh, power plant, for, uh, among others, what they're doing is they can control how much heat do they produce and how much electricity do they, do they produce. So when people are getting up in the morning and when people are cooking in the evening, there you have some excess power consumptions. One way there is to say, well, if they can just produce more power for a period of time and less heat, that benefits the system as such, the combined system. And then you may have some, and then you just have a buffer in the system for the heat, and it's not a problem that you don't put new energy out into the heat brain. I don't know if that's the case for this data. This here, um, this is just white. This is just random. This is just uh, independent Gaussian standard Gaussian distributed numbers with appropriate variance. So that's just if you take a random number generator and produce an adequate number of, of samples. We'll get back to that in much further detail. <laughs> so. Today, we will talk about multivariate random variables. Next week, we'll talk about predictions in the general linear model. Um, assume you have seen the linear regression model before, but I will phrase some things maybe in a little bit dif different way than what you've seen before. And then, of course, we'll do some time series models. And then we will look into some theory of linear systems, but not go into full detail. And then, as mentioned, temperature as an external input. And also, what is not on the list here is to look at, you can say, general multivariate models. So the external input there, you have an input and an output. But sometimes you want to say, well, there may also be a connection from the output to the input. So you have a closed loop system. So there are many different combinations there, and we'll look at that in general as well. So a lot of this is about characterizing time series. Now we just looked at, you can say, one simple example. We want to look at what is the correlation structure, because that is what's going to help us to figure out what to do whenever we see these weird patterns in the residuals. Correlation comes to some extent after covariance, and it's related to covariance, when we, when we look at multivariate systems, we have cross-correlation. We're going to look at, you can see, a lot of signals. What we want to do is to make a filter, effectively, that goes through that and gives us some estimates of where we are and uncertainty. And then, you can see, the hard part, I think, here, that's also where statistics and also time series become subjective. When you have to do modeling of a particular system, you have some data, you have some different guides that helps you what to do within different frameworks, but it doesn't say that this is the one and only answer. There's many places here where there will be choices that you can make. So the one sitting next to you may make another choice that is also a good choice. And it's not necessarily clear if one is better than the other. Sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's not clear. And what I want you to do is, in the modeling there, is to argue for what you do. Because that's why you show what makes a difference. So if one model is a fraction better than your model, it's not necessarily a problem, as long as you argue for what you've done. But I'll get back to that many times later on. And then prediction with a measure of uncertainty. I've often phrased it with a measure of uncertainty rather than to say a prediction interval or a standard error or something, because in the different settings, it may be different things that is better at communicating what you want to communicate in the particular case. So, but I always, whenever you present an estimate, it should come with a measure of uncertainty. 
being a prediction, being it a parameter that you estimated. So today, multivariate random variables, we're going to look at distribution functions, density functions, in general, the multivariate normal distribution, marginal densities, conditional densities, expectations, and other moments, moments of multivariate random variables, what is the conditional expectation, and I think now is the time where we start to step to, to the border, what have you seen before, and then maybe a little bit on what comes after the normal distribution, and the linear projection theorem that you probably haven't seen in this setting before. But it's basically just a conditional mean. So, a random variable, multivariate random variable, what is that? I assume you all know what a random variable is, just a univariate thing. So what we do here is we make a vector where each of them, each element is a random variable. That should be a fairly easy generalization for those of you who haven't seen it before. You've probably looked at a joint distribution function before, at least in a univariate case where you'll say the probability of x, the random variable x1 being less than or equal to a given number, lowercase x1, Basically, when you go to a multivariate setting, you just add all the dimensions in here. So that's the same story, basically. The one thing that I'll try to go all the way through is uppercase letters are random variable, lowercase letters are constants. So that, that's one thing just to make life easier. It's a bit harder when I do it on a blackboard, um, but that's the other thing. And bold letters are vectors or matrices. So you may not always be able to see the difference between a matrix and a vector um, with this notation, but that should be clear from the context. Otherwise, just ask. So what is a multivariate random variables we look at the joint distribution function here. Sometimes you also like to look at the density, and it's the same thing that you do in the multivariate setting as you do in a univariate setting. You just look at the derivative, in this case the partial derivative, at the point where you want to know something. It's basically just the same. Now. How many of you have had the course here to you on probability theory? So from what I remember from there, I don't know if it still is, then you look at the, not the general multivariate normal distribution, but you look at the bivariate normal distribution. Is that still the case? And basically, well, going from two dimension one to two is a large step, two to three to four. The only problem when you go to higher dimension is very difficult to draw. I mean, there are more, more challenges as well, but we'll try to break it down whenever we can to be something that is univariate, that are independent of other univariates, and then life is easy, but we'll get back to that. So, as in univariate case, to go from the density to the joint, you just have distribution function, you just have to integrate everything out. And you just have one integral for each dimension. We don't want to calculate those integrals if we get around it, and I don't think you'll ever have to do an integral throughout this course, at least not a lot. I mean, I, there may be one place where it's beneficial, but so this is basically just to understand, you can see how are things behind the scenes, how are things connected, um, and then we'll try to do things calculation-wise in a way so we get around these things. And then in the discrete case, well, then you have the opportunity to be equal, because when you have discrete numbers, there is a likelihood of observing that particular number, it, whereas in the continuous case, it's zero. But I will mention the discrete case but I won't cover it. We'll focus on things that are normally distributed all the way out, 
And if things are not, we'll try to make the best assumption transformations or whatever, so we, we can treat them as normally distributed things. So for the normal distribution, as I said, that's going to be the core. I want to have I thought I could get some white chalk, but there's only colored chalk. <laughs> I'll get by with that. So the joint probability density function of variable x. Well, how is this different from the univariate case? You have the 2 pi. In the univariate case, you take the square root here. We just raise it to the dimension half power and then what we add and this can be written in many ways is the determinant of the covariance matrix for the system in a unitary case this is just sigma and then we have the exponential again and then we have minus one half, we have the same thing in a univariate case. And when we have the observation minus the mean value, and then here comes, we have to transpose this, and then you have the inverse sigma. So that is in the univariate case, you divide by lowercase sigma square. But in the multivariate case, we need to make sure that we look at the right elements here. We'll get back and get around this in other cases as well. And the covariance matrix is symmetric and it's positive symmetry in it. And we'll use the notation that x comes from a normal distribution with some mean value as vector here. and a covariance matrix of a case sigma. And a standard normal distribution, also multivariate, well, that has mean zero and it has variance one. So in the multivariate setting, you have a vector of zeros as your mean values and you have the identity matrix of the appropriate dimension as your covariance matrix, meaning that there's, they're all independent. We'll get back to that again. So what does that mean? That means if we take a standard normal the, the distributed random variable set here, we multiply by a matrix and add a mean value, then we get a random variable. When you multiply by a number here, remember what do we do in the univariate case when you take a random variable and multiply by a scalar, what is the variance of that? Do you recall? I'm sure you've seen it before. Yes? The scalar square. The scalar square, exactly. Now, in the univariate case, you also want to square this, but you want to have it by the transpose of it. So, basically, it's the same thing. So you post multiply the variance that was the identity. Maybe I should do it a little bit more. So the variant of T set here is T on the variance of set T transpose. Now this here is the identity matrix. So therefore it's skipped up there to just give t, t transpose. So with this, then we have whatever normal distribution we have, we just have to do some factorization of the covariance matrix in order to get something that is, now I'll say in quotes, a standard deviation. Of, it's not as such, but it, something that when you square it, then you get to the variance. And you can, of course, also take 
something and you can create a new random variable by doing the same transformation and then you get the same structure. The mean value is just the expectation of this that's just calculating the means and the variance is following the same thing as what is done down here. Now it's just the variance of x that goes in there, so there's a sigma there instead of the hidden identity matrix up there. And there are a few more things added in section 2.7, um, but I won't get into that. Just a small teasing thing. Here I have the univariate identity function for a variable x and minus x. If you look at the Identities, they are identical. But the two random variables are not the same. So you can have something that has the same distribution, but they're still different variables. Just kind of one of those mental things just to keep in mind. It will generally always be the case when you have multiply something by minus one. In this case, since it is a standard normal, it will be the same. So as long as the mean value is zero, multiplying by minus one gives you, you can say, the same distribution, but a different variable. OK, going back to probability theory, what is the interpretation of the marginal density function for a random variable? A multivariate random variable, what you do is, you have it, it's n-dimensional, and then you want to look at only k-dimensions. Basically, what you do is to find the marginal density function as the density function of all those that you want to keep, x1 to xk, and then you integrate the density function out for all the remaining dimensions, from k plus 1 till xn. So this is one of the things that is easier to do in a two-dimensional case than it's mentally at least accessible. What is it that we are doing? If we have say x1 and x2, and then I'll just make up a joint distribution function in here by drawing a contour. Now, this contour here, what does that actually say about those two variables there? Are they independent, first of all? No, they're not. Why are they not independent? How can you see that? Sorry? It's not symmetric. It's not symmetric. It's, it's not symmetric. Well, it is symmetric around an axis there. Yeah. So what should be fulfilled if they were independent? Yes? Exactly. Then everything will be circles. Exactly. So it's a correlation structure that gives you the ellipses. So, I mean, you, you have, you're right, it's just a, it's not too sharp uh, in the phrasing. So, now, what is, if I want to look at the marginal density of F for the subset here, it's called Fs, of just x1. What is it that I'm looking at? I mean, I can write out the equation, but what is the interpretation of that? So the equation is that I integrate all the entire space, the joint density of x1 comma x2 dx2. That's what I do. Yes? Just shifting the space and looking at F1 dimension. I'm looking only in, in the X1 direction, exactly. But what am I doing about the second dimension? 
Exactly. I'm integrating, it was along all the vertical lines here. And then what I get is something that looks like this. So that's the marginal. So that's the same case here. I drew a little bit more correlation than what is there. Personally, and I think that I know this is a subjective personal thing, and you look at some nice 3D plots there, they're nice to look at, but they're very difficult to get any sensible information out of. So I'm in preference of, say, an image there where you can actually see what is the structure in space. And well, it's nice to get down to 2D again, no doubt. Now, the next thing is, what is then the conditional probability? Let me redo this drawing. So what is then the added thing when you do a conditional distribution? Yes? Exactly. So you pick this particular value and then you look across this. You look at all the numbers here. And then there is one question. What has to be fulfilled to constitute a distribution function? Yes? Exactly, it should integrate to one. So if I just take the numbers along that dotted line there, do they integrate to one? They don't. When I integrate all the entire space, it integrates to one. So what do I need to do? Yes? I have to normalize it somehow. And the easiest thing to do is I just normalize with the integral across and we're done. So this means when I look at this particular here, I get a density that looks like this, whereas if I change to look at, say, up here, then the density of the conditional expectation looks like this. So because they're correlated, they're, you can say the mean value changes in this setting. So <coughs> that's what is written here. You take the joint density and you normalize by the marginal density along x2. Because the marginal density of x2 equals to this value, that is exactly the integral all across here. That was what we said exactly over here, just for x1, but that's the same story. So the conditional expectation or the conditional distribution is a joint density divided by the marginal density of what you want to leave out, basically. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, of, of the one that you condition on. Sorry, that was what I wanted to say. Good. Independence. Yes? The sum of all those. This is particular for one x two value exactly, um, and you would not. Um, I don't quite understand why, how you want to phrase it. Um, so you can say. 
the marginal, the idea behind the marginal is that you say, okay, now I'm only focusing on one or a subset of the dimensions in the space, and then I integrate everything else out. Whereas in the conditional case, I'm saying that given that these others are fixed, what is then happening? So it's two different stories. Um, you can say, if you look at all the conditional here, then you can say, if you look at the contour of that, it will not look like the contour of this. The reason being that you, everywhere here, you normalize by the marginal distribution on the x2 here. So you won't have this that it goes to zero down here because you take everything is normalized to an integral of one. So you will get something like a band like that in that direction instead. Um, you get some lines. I actually never done that, but <laughs> so I had to kind of think of what your, your question. Um, but there are many things I haven't done. All the things I want to do. <laughs> so, independence. In this case, we discussed that they are dependent, they're not independent. So, if knowledge of X does not give any information about Y, then we say, then we get that the conditional density of Y given a particular value of X is just the marginal. So that is exactly the case if we only have circles over here. Then it, there's no information from x2 to x1 and vice versa. So that's the case, that's the definition of independence. And x and y are stochastically independent. It's defined as if the joint density is the product of the marginal densities. And then again, it's quite easy to see that if you take this here and put that on the other axis as well, and you multiply those together, element-wise, to the outer product of those, then you get circles. So that's the definition. If we can say that, if we can somehow argue that the product of the marginal densities is equal to the joint density, then we have independence. Expectation is something that you can say in just layman's word, we kind of, what is the expectation? That's the mean value. That is the value that we expect, except that we are not likely to observe it. And that's kind of the mental small thing here. So in a univariate case, the definition is that we do the integral or the entire space and what we integrate is the density multiplied by the value that we are of the variable that we're integrating out here in a discrete case well it just become a sum over all the possible outcomes now the expectation here is what's called a linear operator what that means in this case is that when you take the expectation of a sum of some different elements, then you can do the expectation on each element on its own. So that is one of the things that helps you out. It's just like integrals. You can do them by part of different uh, parts of the sum. Because it is just an integral. So that's the same thing that applies. So this is one of the places where Yes, it is an integral, but we'll ju just do like this without actually doing the integration. And that also means there's the first rule here. Well, if you have a constant in an integral, you can move it outside. Same thing here. If you have a constant inside an expectation, you can move it outside. So whenever you have to prove all these calculation rules, think of it as integrals, but I don't expect you to prove those. Now, that was the expectation, which is also called the first order moment. We can also look at x to a different power. 
say the end power or the second power, typically I will not go much further than the second power. So we have the end moment defined like this. So the expectation of something, maybe you can always guess right now, if you take the expect expectation of a function of x, you just have to write that function of x there and integrate that over the, with the uh, multiply it by the density and integrate it or the outcome space. That's how life is. So that's the end moment. We also have what's called the end central moment. And central is basically just like when you do for a normal distribution, you subtract the mean value, then you have mean value zero. That's the same thing you do here. You subtract the expected value from x, and then you do the same thing as you did before. It's just a function that you have in here, and you just change that function to include, well, an integral, but we can do that first, and then we can do all the rest later. And the second central moment is what we call the variance. And I don't know, have you all seen that expression down there before? No. no, that was kind of expected, so that was why I got some chalk. So the variance of x is the second se central moment, so it's the expectation of x minus the expectation of x, let me square this part in here. Now, oops, and I'll try to remember to make expectations in square parentheses just to make sure that you can see the difference. When am I closing what? <laughs> we can multiply this in here out. So then I get an x square and I get, what like do I get more? I get an, the expectation of x square, and then I get minus two times x, the expectation of x. Right? Now, remember, that the expectation, can I ask one of you to just close the door up there? Is a linear operator, so I can do this element-wise. So I have the expectation of x squared. Well, the expectation of the expectation. The expectation of x is a constant. So a constant, the expectation of a constant is just the constant. So I get the expectation of x where the square is outside, and then I have minus two times the expectation of x. Ah, let me write it in two, in two steps. Times the expectation of x inside here. Now, the expectation of x is also constant. So I can move that outside, so that this term out here, that is the expectation of x times the expectation of x. Or just expectation of x squared, as we have just there as well. So here we have plus expectation of x, here we have minus 2. So we end up having the expectation of x squared, and we're left with minus the expectation of x squared. Now I think that is ah, time to take a break, also for us now. Let's resume 10 minutes past, then I'll try to speed up.